origin regions. The regions of origin for immigration populations residing in the U.S. have dramatically shifted since the passage of the 1965 Immigration and Naturalization Act. In 1960, 84% of immigrants living in the U.S. were born in Europe, Canada, or other North American countries. Other North American countries? Uh, other than Canada <laughs> and the U.S.? What other North American countries are? Oh, Mexico. <laughs> hmm. While only 6% were from Mexico, 4% from Asia, 3% from the rest of Latin America, and 3% from other areas. Immigrant origins now differ drastically, with European, Canadian, and other North American immigrants making up only a small share of the foreign-born population, 13%. Asians, 28%. Mexicans, 25%. And other Latin Americans, 25%. Each make up about a quarter of the U.S. immigrant population, followed by 9% who were born in another region. Hmm. The nation's immigrants are more settled today than they were in 1990, when the share of those who had arrived within the past 10 years peaked at 44%. Now the amount of time that immigrants have spent in the U.S. has grown. In 2018, 73% of immigrants had lived in the U.S. for over 10 years up from 56% in 1990, but similar to the share in 1970. Starting as early as 2010, more Asian immigrants than Hispanic immigrants have arrived annually, a reversal of historical trends. In the early 2000s, the number of newly arrived Hispanic immigrants greatly outnumbered newly arrived Asian immigrants. Around the time of the Great Recession, Latin American immigration declined sharply, especially from Mexico. The U.S.-born children of immigrants, second-generation Americans, make up 12% of the nation's population. By 2050, immigrants and their children could account for 19% and 18% of the population, respectively, according to Pew Research Center projections. Sorry, my chair is very squeaky. Since 1980, the share of immigrants who are proficient in English, those who speak only English at home or speak English at least very well, has declined, though it has increased slightly in recent years. This decline has been driven entirely by those who speak only English at home, which fell from 30% of immigrants ages 5 and older in 1980 to 17% in 2018. The share who speaks English very well, meanwhile, has increased slightly from 27 to 37% over the same time. Among the nation's immigrants, Spanish is by far the most spoken non-English language. 42% of immigrants say they speak Spanish at home, but it is not the only non-English language spoken by immigrants. Some 6% of immigrants speak Chinese, including Mandarin and Cantonese. 5% speak Hindi or a related language. 4% speak Filipino or Tagalog. 3% speak Vietnamese. 3% speak French, and 2% speak Dravidian. And I will show my ignorance here and say I don't know where Dravidian comes from. So I don't know who those people are. I should look that up. Education levels among the nation's immigrants have been steadily rising since the 1960s, just like the native-born population. While there have been gains across the board, the increases have been most dramatic among immigrants from Asia, Europe, and the Middle East, and less so among those from Mexico and Central America. The nation's unauthorized immigrant population grew rapidly between 1990 and 2007, reaching a peak of 12.2 million. Since then, the population declined to 10.5 million in 2017. Unauthorized immigrants from Mexico make up less than half of all unauthorized immigrants and have been a driver of the group's population decline. The number of unauthorized immigrants from Mexico fell from a peak of 6.9 million in 2007 to 4.9 million in 2017. About one quarter of the U.S. foreign-born population is unauthorized immigrants, while the majority of the nation's immigrants are in the U.S. legally. Naturalized citizens account for the largest portion of the foreign-born population, 45%. Uh -huh. 
So those are just some random facts and figures that, that may be useful to you. Um, okay, moving on. Uh, next article is entitled Karina Ruiz de Diaz Fights for Immigration Reform Helps Dreamers Navigate Change. In June, the Supreme Court ruled that President Trump's administration wrongly ended the program that allowed hundreds of thousands of undocumented DACA recipients to temporarily live and work in the U.S. without deportation. That program was begun by President Obama's administration. Ruiz de Diaz spoke with U.S. Today Network about what that ruling has meant for her organization and the people she serves. Some answers have been edited for length and clarity. So the question, what issues and projects are most important right now? During a time when DACA is consistently under attack by the Trump administration, it is important to get informed support to get informed. Support your local organizations and encourage those that can vote to participate civically. There is a lot of misinformation and we have worked hard to educate families about the policy changes, application process, and the finances pertaining to DACA and the constant changes in legislation that affect our immigrant families. To continue doing this work, we need constant volunteers and people to vote for candidates that support DACA and policies that help immigrant communities. Question. If you and your group could affect one change, what would it be? A long-term alternative to DACA that continues a pathway to citizenship nationally. Locally, we would like to have access to higher education and in-state tuition for immigrant youth. We must also work on a more systemic change that includes defunding the agencies that criminalize people of color and immigrants like ICE and CBP. We also want our community to be counted in the 2020 census and turn as many voters to the polls so we can have better leadership in Congress and our local legislature. Question. Who or what inspires you in your advocacy work? My community worked hard to raise the next generation of leaders and accomplished that with minimum to zero resources. I made it my life mission to work toward giving back tools and resources that would continue that movement. The youth who were left out of DACA are also a source of inspiration. I see myself reflected because I lived that struggle of not being able to have access to higher education due to my immigration status. Finally, the parents in the movement, including mine, are one of my biggest sources of inspiration because they were original dreamers and the resilience has grounded us. Question. Looking ahead, what do you hope to see in a year, in five years? Legislation that provides a permanent solution for all immigrants. This is something we have been fighting for over the past 20 years. I would also like to see the defunding of ICE, CBP, and police to stop the criminalization of our community. Instead, invest the funds in resources that actually help us, like education and health care. Question. What is the core mission for you and your organization? Our mission is to promote the educational success of immigrant youth, increase civic engagement, integrate immigrants into Arizona's economy to the fullest extent possible, and to advocate for immigrant rights. In addition, we strive to provide low cost to free services such as DACA application help, citizenship application assistance, scholarship applications slash grants for undocumented DACA students, deportation defense and COVID-19 relief funds and food bank. And the last questions are, who are the allies that support your work? How can someone interested in the work get involved? And the answer is, anyone who feels strongly about the immigration movement is an ally. Interesting. Okay, and uh, sort of stepping back to an earlier story, I, I should have read this one before the last one. This is entitled, Naturalization Ceremony at RNC Stands at Odds with Trump's Stance on Immigration. So this will be some of the same information, but uh, this is just another uh, 
the story on the subject. President Trump sought Tuesday to wrap himself in pro-immigrant sentiment even though his administration has waged a years-long assault on the nation's immigration system. By presiding over a naturalization ceremony at the White House during the second night of the Republican National Convention. I read that incorrectly. Let me read it again with the proper inflections because it sounded very weird the way I said it. President Trump sought Tuesday to wrap himself in pro-immigrant sentiment even though his administration has waged a years-long assault on the nation's immigration system. By presiding over... It, it's, it's, yeah, it doesn't work. So President Trump sought Tuesday to wrap himself in pro-immigrant sentiment by presiding over a naturalization ceremony at the White House during the second night of the Republican National Convention, even though his administration has waged a years-long assault on the nation's immigration system. There, I fixed it for you. Using the majesty of the White House for blatantly political purposes, very true, Mr. Trump appeared during the convention's second hour as Hail to the Chief played and strode to a lectern where five immigrants were waiting to take the oath to become citizens. Today, America rejoices as we welcome five absolutely incredible new members into our great American family, he told them in a 10-minute ceremony that had been taped in the afternoon. It was not the first time Mr. Trump has presided over such a ceremony, but the willingness to use the trappings of presidential power during a campaign convention was a stunning departure from the past, in which prior presidents have avoided seeming to blur the lines between official actions and political activity. This administration, editorial aside, doesn't mind blurring lines, it doesn't mind crossing lines, it doesn't mind obliterating lines if they get in its way. And that alone, if for no other reason, <laughs> that alone is a serious, serious problem with this administration and with the other people that support it, the entire party that is supporting it and not calling them out on it. That is a serious problem, just by itself, all alone, with nothing else. You can just ignore everything else about it and just think about that one thing. And that tells you as much as you need to know about what's wrong or about something that's wrong and about something that is intolerable and cannot be supported in the future. Okay, I'm going to move on. I'm sorry. Uh, and Mr. Trump's explicit claim that he loves and appreciates immigrants stands in stark contrast to his record over the past four years during which he has repeatedly pursued anti-immigrant policies, often fueled by xenophobic language. The president has largely blocked asylum seekers and refugees fleeing persecution, war, and violence. He has built nearly 300 miles of border wall, though without persuading Mexico to pay for it, as he once insisted. He has made it harder for poor people to immigrate to the United States, imposed travel bans on predominantly Muslim countries, and separated migrant children from their parents at the border. At times, he has used racist messaging, condemning blank countries, we all know the term, and complaining that people from Haiti have AIDS. That messaging was at the heart of Mr. Trump's 2016 campaign, when he complained that Mexico was sending rapists and criminals to the United States. At the time, he vowed to build a border wall and used grim and threatening language about immigrants to instill fear in his supporters. As president, he has made good on many of those promises and again using a fear of immigrants to energize his core supporters during the 2018 midterm elections. He warned falsely that migrant caravans from Central America were filled with murderers and criminals when in fact most were families with women and children fleeing persecution, war, famine, and violence. The 2018 effort largely failed as Democrats retook control of the House, but Mr. Trump and his political advisors have signaled that they still intend to use immigration as a central issue in his re-election campaign. On Tuesday night, the decision to preside over the naturalization ceremony appeared to be intended to soften his attacks on immigration for particular groups of voters, suburbanites, people of color, and women who might be put off by his usually strident talk. After listening to the five immigrants take the oath required to become citizens, Mr. Trump approached the lectern to briefly share each of their stories. 
Congratulations, he said. That's fantastic. That's really great. But the strong anti-immigrant messaging that he has long delivered to his most fervent supporters is not likely to change anytime soon. Even though he praised the new citizens, Mr. Trump has long sought to reduce legal immigration into the United States and has recently moved to shrink or eliminate visa programs that allow companies to hire foreigners to work in the United States. Aides to the president brag about the reductions in overall immigration, saying the efforts are helping protect Americans from having to compete with immigrants for jobs. Just last week, during a briefing from border officials in Yuma, Arizona, the president had similar praise for a very different achievement. That's fantastic. That's fantastic. He told border officials about the completion of nearly 300 miles of the border wall. So it's a great, it's a great feeling to have closed up the border. So just in case you weren't entirely sure <laughs> where they stand, it is firmly against immigration and immigrants. So those of us who are immigrants or who are families of immigrants, who know immigrants, have friends, immigrants who admire immigrants, who think that they are a valuable, uh, that they are valuable contributors to our communities, have to be aware that the current administration is actively working to remove as many as they can and to keep as many as they can out, period. Whatever else they say, that's what they're doing. Case in point. <clears throat> Border officials weighed deploying migrant heat ray ahead of midterm. Heat ray. Sounds like science fiction. Fifteen days before the 2018 midterm elections, as President Trump sought to motivate Republicans with dark warnings about caravans heading to the U.S. border, he gathered his Homeland Security Secretary and White House staff to deliver a message. Extreme action was needed to stop the migrants. That afternoon, at a separate meeting with top leaders of the Department of Homeland Security, Customs and Border Protection officials suggested deploying a microwave weapon, a heat ray, designed by the military to make people's skin feel as if it is burning when they get within range of its invisible beams. Yes. Developed by the military as a crowd dispersal tool two decades ago, the active denial system had been largely abandoned amid doubts over its effectiveness and morality. Two former officials who attended the afternoon meeting at the Department of Homeland Security on October 22, 2018, said the suggestion that the device be installed at the border shocked attendees, even if it would have satisfied the president. Kirsten Nielsen, then the Secretary of Homeland Security, told an aide after the meeting that she would not authorize the use of such a device and that it should never be brought up again in her presence, the officials said. Alexei Woltornist, Woltornist, the spokesman for the department, said Wednesday that it was never considered. It is not known whether Mr. Trump knew of the microwave weapon suggestion, but the discussion in the fall of 2018 underscored how Mr. Trump's obsession with shutting down immigration has driven policy considerations, including his suggestions of installing flesh-piercing spikes at the border wall, building a moat filled with snakes and alligators, and shooting migrants in the leg. His suggestions. <laughs> Mine. The Republican National Convention on Tuesday night featured a small citizenship naturalization ceremony at the White House, clearly intended to try to soften the president's image as a heartless opponent of immigrants. In 2018, the president's hard immigration policies may well have backfired when suburban women recoiled at the images of children separated from their families and migrants in cages. A Democratic wave that November, that November, driven by such voters, swept Republicans from control of the House. But for his core supporters, Mr. Trump's immigration agenda is again at the heart of his campaign and the unrest roiling cities from Portland, Oregon to Kenosha, Wisconsin could give it more punch. The pitch? He is delivered on perhaps the central promise of his 2016 run to effectively cut off America from foreigners who he said posed security and economic threats. 
Through hundreds of regulations, policy directives, and structural changes, the president has profoundly reshaped the government's vast immigration bureaucracy. His campaign will also concentrate on making searing and often false attacks against former Vice President Joseph Biden Jr., telling voters that the president's rival wants to fling open the nation's borders to criminals and disease-carrying immigrants who will take hard-working Americans' jobs. The public health necessity and the economic necessity of controlling immigration has placed the view of the Democrats left even more radically outside the pale of mainstream American thought. Stephen Miller, the architect of the president's immigration policy, said this week in an interview. Man. <laughs> Being hard left <laughs> of Stephen Miller is, is, in my opinion, being kind of far, pretty far right. Anyway, sorry, that's an editorial aside that didn't need to be there. The president tweeted last month that the radical left Democrats want open borders for anyone, including many criminals, to come in. Hmm. Mr. Biden's campaign said such false attacks would be as politically ineffective as they were in 2018, long before the coronavirus and economic recession. Quote, doubling down on divisive poison says one thing to voters, that even after all his devastating failed leadership has cost us, and even though Joe Biden has been showing him the way for months, Donald Trump still has no strategy for overcoming the pandemic, the overwhelming priority for the American people, said Andrew Bates, a spokesman for Mr. Biden's presidential campaign. Sorry, my voice is drying out. <clears throat> Mr. Biden has not called for open borders or embraced getting rid of immigration and customs enforcement as some on the Democratic left flank have sought. He has said he would roll back Mr. Trump's immigration policy, promising to restore asylum rules, end separation of migrant families at the border, reverse limits on legal immigration, and impose a 100-day moratorium on deportations. But Mr. Biden and Democratic congressional candidates are bracing for what they expect will be a concerted focus on one of the most polarizing issues in American politics made even more divisive by Mr. Trump's embrace of ugly, xenophobic language about foreigners. Some of Mr. Trump's biggest immigration promises from 2016 have fallen short. No big, beautiful wall stretches the length of the southern border, paid for by Mexico. Instead, the president spent billions of dollars of taxpayer money to replace about 300 miles of existing barriers with a hulking wall built of steel slats. Like the heat ray, many of the president's ideas, including the moat and shooting migrants in the legs, were thwarted by his own officials. Other policy proposals have been blocked by federal judges who have ruled that they violate existing laws, administrative rules, or the Constitution. But even the president's fiercest critics concede that on immigration, the president can rightly claim that he did much of what he said he would do. The Trump administration unilaterally, without passing laws in Congress, has radically reshaped immigration in the United States, said Omar Jadwa, the director of the Immigrant Rights Project at the American Civil Liberties Union. They have effectively shut down the asylum system at the border. They've reintroduced religious, racial, and national origin discrimination into our immigration system. These are real radical shifts. Because of the president's policies, Central American migrants fleeing persecution and violence in their home countries now must wait, often for months, in squalid camps on the Mexico side of the border while the United States considers their requests for asylum. For decades, asylum seekers were allowed to remain in the United States while their cases were decided. Mr. Trump derides that as catch and release which he says allows hundreds of thousands of migrants to fraudulently claim persecution as a means of entering the United States and then disappearing into the country illegally. He repeatedly said that it was his top priority to end the practice. There's so much wrong with that, too, but uh, never mind. Advocates say he has largely succeeded, aided in part by the coronavirus pandemic. The president has used emergency powers intended for public health crises to turn away all asylum seekers, effectively ending the role of the United States as a place of refuge for those fleeing their homes. 
Those deeply rooted changes are a bell that can never be unrung, one senior aide said. Even before the pandemic, Mr. Trump had lowered the annual cap for refugees to a trickle, shutting the United States off from war-torn countries like Syria or Somalia. Refugees have been left separated from their families, or in the United States they've been left without access to critical medical care, or have been left in places where their lives are in danger, said Eleanor Acer, the Senior Director for Refugee Protection at Human Rights First. And for refugees seeking asylum, the asylum system has been totally decimated. Refugees seeking asylum have been turned back to some of the most dangerous places in the world. And from the early days, earliest days of his presidency, Mr. Trump has used national security concerns to justify a crackdown on immigration from around the globe, imposing a travel ban on several predominantly Muslim countries, only days after taking office in January 2017. A version of that travel ban remains in place and served as the template for other travel bans put in place during the pandemic. Processing of visa applications from many countries had already slowed to a crawl before the health crisis as the administration aggressively put in place what the president called extreme vetting of people from countries deemed to harbor terrorists. The Trump administration has also moved aggressively to reduce the flow of legal immigrants who have for decades sought to live and work in the United States. It has drafted new regulations aimed at making it harder for poor immigrants to qualify for entry into the United States, arguing that they would be a financial burden on the country. And it has aggressively sought to eliminate programs that allowed American companies to lure foreign workers to the United States for jobs. Mr. Miller, in particular, has argued that such programs put working class Americans at a competitive disadvantage, a potent campaign theme, though experts say that overall, Immigrants do not drive down wages or take jobs from American citizens. Some conservatives say Mr. Trump has not gone far enough to stop immigrants from working in the United States. There are areas where this administration isn't as hawkish as they should be, said Mark Krikorian, the executive director of the Center for Immigration Studies, which pushes for immigration restrictions. He said Mr. Trump had failed to push for a program that would let employers quickly determine if a worker was in the country illegally. Where the hell is E-Verify, he asked. Mr. Krikorian said the president has done little to end the H-2B visa program that allows companies to hire temporary workers from abroad for seasonal jobs. The H-2B program shouldn't exist. It is harmful, period. Still, David Lappin, who served briefly as the top spokesman for the Department of Homeland Security in 2017, said the president's success in pushing through his immigration agenda would make it difficult for Mr. Biden should he win in November. If the president is not reelected and Joe Biden becomes the president, he and his administration are going to have their hands full on a number of fronts, COVID chief among them, Mr. Lappin said. Trying to undo the damage that has been done to the immigration system is going to be a further challenge. And how much is the next administration able to focus on that, given the panoply of challenges they're going to face? Well, that's it for me today. Uh, I have to go, but we will talk to you next week or next time or whenever. See you then.